All right, futures are ripping this morning. We got a 3% rally in the Russell, percent pretty much everywhere else. Let's talk about how the number fits into the market, which has been very AI focused, but now it might have a little economic lift as well. Cameron Dawson joins us, Chief Investment Officer at New Edge Wealth. Great to have you here this morning, Cameron. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Uh, so is this the magic piece of the puzzle here for bulls this morning? What do you think? I think it is important with the potential that it could spark a broadening out rally or rebroadening out because to your point we've seen this market be incredibly narrow over the last month or so only 46% of names as of the close of yesterday were trading above their 50 day moving average which meant that even though we were at all time highs, a lot of stocks were really still struggling. So it will be interesting to see if this softer CPI print can print can spark a rally in those other names. To your point, the Russell 2000 is certainly rallying a lot this morning. That's effectively beta on the 10 year Treasury yield. So in order for that rally to continue, we think you would need to see follow through with 10 year Treasury yields continuing to move lower. A good reminder is that the big nearly 30 percent rally we saw in the Russell 2000s back at the end of last year came because of a hundred basis point decline in the 10 year Treasury. So, of course, course, there's a lot more to judge to see if this can continue. Wow. Yeah, the Russell always seems to get stopped out at 2100, but we're basically gunning for it this morning. Is it basically as uh, one to one with rates as uh, the market gets? This is where that relationship is pretty much binary. It certainly seems that way. I think it is also important to note that relative performance got really oversold for the Russell 2000 as of yesterday as well. We actually undercut those October lows from 2023, meaning the Russell has simply sat out of all of the rally this year because of that overhang from yields. Now, we're not so certain if lower yields, maybe a Fed cut by 25 or 50 basis points over the next year or so is enough to bail out very low quality companies within the Russell 2000s, so those that have to refinance a lot of debt, those that are dealing with floating rate debt balances that are very high, but you can have this counter trend rally with the relief in yields simply because you got so oversold and unloved. Okay, the dollar breaking down here pretty hard. Some of these things have been in a, a fairly intense battle the last two months trying to figure out direction uh, in terms of setting direction and tone for these macro trades we're talking about. Do you think Powell is sort of the, uh, the confirmation, should we have answer for trend by the end of this week, given that we've got uh, a boss man coming out this afternoon? I would bet that we stay in this whipsaw simply because, mm. yes, we could have boss man and Powell talk <laughs> about leaving the door open to rate cuts as he's done really over the last, let's call it a year, where he has leaned much more dovish. But we actually think that the dot plot that we get today could lean rather hawkish and create potential for a lot of volatility and uncertainty, not just in the dollar, but in yields as well. When we look at the dot plot as it stands today, what we're actually most interested in is not the 2024 estimate or median, it's 25 and 26. What you see there is that for the first time in a while, the market is significantly higher than what the Fed is forecasting, meaning the market is not expecting the Fed to cut nearly as much as what the Fed is expecting to cut. We think that effectively reflects some kind of recession forecast somewhere in the Fed's expectations over the next two years. But given their conversations about higher for longer, given their questions about the effectiveness of monetary policy on growth, note that that is the topic for the Jackson Hole meeting in August, we think we could see those forecasts for 25 and 26 move higher, which could have then again create that volatility, mostly in the longer end of the curve. So taking some of the near term possibility of cuts to shift it back further into something a little bit more responsive to an economic downturn. Well, that is what we think is somewhat priced into the Fed zone forecast when you go out into 2026. But given the amount of discussion about how interest rate hikes have not weighed on economic activity nearly as much as they expected, mm -hmm. we would also expect, maybe not at this meeting, maybe in September, you start seeing some dots defect higher on the long run neutral rate, mm -hmm. really representing the fact that things like financial conditions, despite 5.5% 5, 5 
percent yields are still at their easiest level since 2021 and likely based on today's market action move even easier which just suggests that there's very little urgency for the fed to change policy at this time yes it removes the the today's cpi data removes the risk that they'd have to raise rates further but we think they're still in that higher for longer camp until we see more evidence of a more meaningful economic slowdown okay so uh, right now we got a, a decent uh, reassuring print from jobs uh, last week, but the uh, rest of the data been a little bit more mixed. Is this what uh, investors should view as Goldilocks for the time of being, uh, Cameron? I've kind of described Goldilocks and uh, the flip side of that coin being like a purgatory, which was when we got some of our data missing. But is this kind of flip us back to the good side of that coin? Yeah, I mean, it does feel based on today's print rather immaculate when you put it into context of the strong jobs print on the payrolls front that we got last week. Now, of course, the household survey was far weaker. We think that there was a lot of data distortion in the payrolls and overall employment data last week that simply reflected more statistical issues versus underlying demand. We think it's really important in order to judge the underlying strength of this economy to watch the things like in consumption and retail sales. We think the labor and jobs data is very, very messy. And instead to look at how are consumers spending, they have continued to spend really well because of this weaker inflation data today, we actually saw real average hourly earnings turn better than expected, meaning that consumers may not be feeling nearly as much pinch from inflation. So watch personal consumption. And lastly, watch the performance of consumer discretionary stocks versus consumer staple stocks. As long as discretionary is outperforming staples, it likely reflects a resilient consumer, which means it likely reflects a resilient economy. Okay. Cameron, what's the best way then to take advantage of this uh, while we've got that window of the economy holding on, inflation coming off? Is it that type of rotation where we began the conversation going for maybe a little lower quality stuff than what has been generally a very high quality rally? Yeah, we're going to stick in the highest quality parts of the market, most generally for our core positioning. But what we've seen is that even high quality parts of the market have been going on sale over the past couple of months, simply because it's been so narrow in just those tech and AI narrative stories that are high quality. However, they don't necessarily encompass other sectors like things in consumer discretionary or industrials or financials. So we think that you can go into other sectors, but you have to be incredibly selective in that space. We think that we're still late cycle, that balance sheets still matter. We're not in the camp of dumpster diving just because we see those trades as being more ephemeral, more short lived. They certainly can have a lot of beta to the upside, but tend to reverse mostly if you're still in this sticky rates, somewhat sticky inflation, higher for longer kind of world. Okay. Uh, Cameron, the uh, higher for longer, uh, does that mean that if uh, the Fed still can't cut on a short timeline then until something worse happens, does that uh, create complications for the bond side of the portfolio? Does it mean that uh, we might be better off trying to get income in, in equities or how does that trade off look? Well, I think that we have to think of bonds in the duration play versus the credit play, which is that if we look at credit, we are seeing an incredible price for perfection within the bond market because people are looking at all in yields and saying they're still attractive, even though I'm not getting a lot of spread. We think that as long as the economy holds up and growth forecasts continue to move higher, earnings forecasts continue to move higher, that credit can stay well bid. The risk would be is that if you start calling into question the strength of the U.S. economy, can we continue to grow in this 2.5% plus above trend range? Or can we achieve EPS forecasts for 2025, which are extraordinarily high? That starts to call into question how tight credit spreads are. So for now, you can stay in this tight territory. But if you start questioning growth, if we have a growth scare, that's when you would turn a little bit more cautious on the credit story, simply because yield or spreads are so very tight. Got it. Great stuff. Cameron, thanks a lot for the analysis. Uh, great timing to have you here this morning. Appreciate uh, the look here at uh, what might happen. And a little broadening of the rally. Seems like it's a logical thing, so we'll watch for it. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Cameron Dawson, Chief Investment Officer at New Edge Wealth. All right.